Amen. Good to have you. Father, I pray, Lord, that you give me that gift of teaching that I need so much. And our Father, I pray that you give me unction, wisdom in the scriptures. Our Father, let us open our ears and our hearts and hear the word of God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, now, I got something I want to mention to you that I think is very important. And some of you have heard bits and pieces of it. But uh, I wanted to, uh, wanted to uh, read this for you right now. Uh, let's see, here it is. California pro-homosexual bill will ban the Bible. Okay. Uh, this is dated uh, April 28th, 2018, so that makes it very current. There's literally nothing conservatives can do to stop the regressive agenda in the Golden State. California is a picture of what, left, what the left wants the entire United States of America to become. If they have their way, we all one day will look just like it. I've maintained from, from the beginning that the battle between homosexuality and religious liberty is a zero-sum game. What does he mean? Somebody wins, somebody loses. Every advance of the homosexual agenda comes at the expense of religious liberty. It would be nice to think we could all get along, but the reality is we can't. You and I might be prepared to let them live their lives as they choose, but they are not about to return the favor. The homosexual lobby will not rest until they have silenced the last voice of sexual normalcy and punished the last surviving Christian. Their aim is the same as that of the Roman Emperor Diocletian, who struck a medal that celebrated, quote, the name of Christians being extinguished, unquote. Not content with that, he erected a pillar in Spain to congratulate himself, quote, for having everywhere abolished the superstition of Christ, Mr. Diocletian. Most Americans have never heard of him. Lest you think I exaggerate the contemporary dangers posed by the gay movement, I point you to California's in Exhibit A. California has a Democratic supermajority in both houses of the state legislature. All of its statewide offices are held by Democrats. In other words, there is literally nothing conservatives can do to stop the regressive agenda in the Golden State. California's a picture of what the left wants the entire United States to become, if they have their way, we all one day will look just like it. California is showing us the end game. This is important. Showing us the end game of modern liberalism. And it's not pretty. We as Christian conservatives believe that God has designed sex to be exclusively a matter between a husband and a wife. We believe there are just two genders or sexes. And that gender is assigned by God at the moment of conception. We believe that man's a free moral agent, that therefore sexual expression is a matter of choice. Our adversaries on the other side of the battle lines believe none of those things. The California Assembly has passed a new bill, Assembly Bill 2943, which will ban the sale of Bibles. Yes, you read that exactly right. The sale of the Bible is about to be made illegal in the state of California, and the vote wasn't even close. The bill passed 50 to 18. It heads to the Senate next, where it will certainly be approved, then to Governor Jerry Brown's desk, where he is certain to sign it. The bill would make it illegal to engage in a transaction intended to result, or that results, in the sale or lease of goods or services to any consumer that advertise, offer to engage in, or do exchange in sexual orientation change efforts with an individual. These change efforts are then defined as any practices that seek to change an individual's sexual orientation. This includes efforts to change behaviors or gender expressions, or to eliminate or reduce sexual or romantic attractions, or feelings toward individuals of the same sex. The Bible is a book, or a good, to use the language of the bill that clearly teaches that with God's help, homosexual behavior can be changed. 
and sexual energy can be reoriented or redirected toward biblically sanctioned relationships. As Paul writes, 1 Corinthians 6, 9, uh, Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm just reading verbatim. This is not King James Bible. I'm simply reading what he has in the text. But as Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 13, Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but ye were washed, ye were sanctified, ye were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. As Travis Weber of the Center for Religious Liberty writes, Moreover, those bound by this bill include any association or other group, however organized or prohibited from selling goods, which are defined as anything tangible and used primarily for the personal, family, or household purposes. This would include a prohibition on groups of people selling books or materials to other people for their own use, which express the biblical and Christian position on unrepentant homosexual conduct. This could very likely include Christians selling other Christians counseling books on LGBT-related issues, and there is no reason why it can't be construed to include a church bookstore offering these books and even the Bible itself. Itself. Church father Athanasius stood fearlessly and alone for biblical truth in the fourth century. He was once told, Athanasius, the whole world is against you. To which he replied, then Athanasius is against the whole world. The world is soon going to need an entire host of men with the same spirit. Let's pray they may be found. I want to call your attention to something I, I had uh, you know, I've read preached a thousand times. Look over here in, in the book of Romans, chapter number 1. It's funny how stuff like this comes out. It just, when I, I, appear, I, I believe when God wants it to. Now I want you to notice in Romans, chapter number 1. In uh, verses, uh, verses 25 through the rest of the chapter... We have the issue of homosexuality, sodomy, lesbianism, and all the rest of it. But if you'll notice uh, verse number 28, Even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. He did not give them over to a reprobate mind because they were murderers. <laughs> he gave them over to a reprobate mind because they were sexual perverts. I thought I'd never seen that before, but that's exactly what the text says. Look at the last, look at the last verse, uh, the uh, verse number twenty-nine. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, so forth and so on. But the primary reason for God giving them up was sexual perversion, which of course is connected. With all the rest of it. Every sin is interconnected. You understand that, don't you? It's not a big line for a man to cross over once he becomes a reprobate in a sin. There's no big deal for him to cross over from a sexual pervert to a murderer. I don't know if you've ever done any statistic analysis of it or not, but you ought to, you'd be amazed at how much murder is involved in the homosexual community. Not far from where you're sitting right now, one homosexual killed another homosexual. And I will not tell you where... Because I wouldn't want to live in that house. <laughs> but I remember, I've been here a while. And one homosexual killed another homosexual. And it happens all the time. Killed him right there in that house. And it's not far from where you're sitting right now. That's the truth of the world that you're living in now. That's a shame. That's a shame. If you're not, if you're not, you know... How many times do I have to say it? The world I grew up in would never have accepted this. Those men that stormed the beach at Normandy on D-Day did not die for you to have this rammed down your throat. And for the state of California to ban the sale of Bibles. They didn't die for that. We're talking about real veterans of real courage. 
real heroes, not somebody bouncing a ball around on the floor and throwing a pigskin at somebody. That's no hero. That's no role model. If you want a role model, find that man that goes out into combat and goes against the enemy into harm's way, comes back blown all to pieces, one leg. Some of them come back in body bags. That's your hero. We're down here in, uh, in Tennessee. Uh, I forget some, but down here in Tennessee the other day, some nutball took an AR-15, started firing into a, uh, into a waffle house, and a man inside reached up and grabbed the weapon, and when he grabbed the barrel, the barrel gets hot, folks. I know the news media doesn't have a clue what we're talking about, but when that round goes through that barrel, there's friction there, and it gets hot, and so he grabbed that barrel with one hand and grabbed the other end of it and burned his hand. You can see where it's wrapped up, but he stopped the murderer. That's a hero. That's a hero. Hmm. Well, what's it mean, preacher? It means that this is a test case, test state. And depending on, you know, what happens here, it will determine as to what happens in the country. The sad thing is that the approach to God is from the east to the west. A man pointed that out a long time ago. From the east to the west into the tabernacle, all the way back to the Holy of Holies, you're coming in the direction of the movement of the sun. And reverse that and you're going from west to east. Have you noticed how all this garbage that starts in California makes its way across the country to where we are? And this is not to slight. There's a lot of good people in California. We get a lot of emails, a lot of letters uh, from people in California, a lot of good people in there. And they're trying their best to, to, to go against this this flood tide of what's happening in their state. You know, it's, it's uh, thank God for what little bit of salt that's left in California. But man, I'll tell you right now, I don't want to live, I don't want to live the way these people do. No, sir. We are a divided nation. There is no such thing as an LGBT community. <laughs> I know, you're just quoting the, the current... Yeah. To other states like Tennessee and get those people into politics, yeah. get them elected, and right. then they change our laws. Right. There's, I was watching a reading article yesterday that said something like 800,000 people are coming out of California. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah, I saw that. Taxes, tax to death, and further reasons, I'm sure, too, so more than just money. Yeah. Right. And California is a beautiful state. It's one of only two states in the country that used to be a republic, California and Texas. I mean, it's, you know, California is a beautiful, it's called a golden state. Look at all that long shoreline, magnificent shoreline they've got with the Pacific Ocean. And, uh, but I'll tell you right now, there's some corruption coming out of California. Real corruption. It's amazing. That's what's happening. So what will the church do? Sleep on? You've got this crowd out here preaching peace, prosperity. Name it, claim it, blab it, grab it, as if as long as you've got a pile of money, everything's going just fine. It's not going fine. You need to watch it. Next time the election comes around, you need to ask your uh, potential representative or potential senator or governor or mayor or whatever. Say, what do you believe about this House bill in uh, name it off, whatever we got here, the number of it, in California that wants to ban the sale of Bibles? And so what's your position on that? I'm not interested in your position on whether the road ought to be cut through between this hill or somebody's house moved over here. What's your position on this bill out here in California? Yeah. Well, I haven't had time to examine it yet, but if you'll get back with me in about six months from now, after the election, I'll let you know where my position might be on it. And we'll talk about it. We can sit down and have a discussion. And a good politician can talk for 30 minutes and say nothing. <laughs> They're good. They're good at it. <laughs> They're good at it. All right. Now, how many, of you, how many of you woke up this morning and thought to yourself, we're still here? How many of you forgot the rapture, tw the, the 23rd? You just now remembered, right? The rapture was supposed to take place the 23rd. Now he's saying he's being misrepresented, that there's, a, there's an expanse here from the 23rd on up to a certain date. And he uses some very interesting material here. 
The biblical prophecy claims the rapture is coming April the 23rd, numerologist says. His name is David Mead, uh, UK. He's a Brit, United Kingdom. And, uh, well, I don't know. Hold on a minute. He tells the UK's Daily Express newspaper. That doesn't mean he's a, that he's a Brit. I don't know. Has anybody researched his background? David Mead, do you, any, does anyone know anything about this fellow? All right. You know, I have nothing, no bone to pick with him personally. None of this has to do with, his, with him personally. It has to do with his prophecy of the rapture taking place the 23rd. Is the rapture finally here? One Christian numerologist says a biblical sign strongly suggested. David Mead tells the UK's Daily Express newspaper on 23rd of April, the sun and moon will be in Virgo, as with Jupiter, which represents the Messiah for a certain branch of evangelical Christianity. Revelation 12, 1 through 2, describes the beginning of what is known as the rapture and the second coming of Christ. And here's what happens. He ties this in with this planet X, Nibiru. And NASA says, and along with the astronomers and the scientists, they say that this planet Nibiru, this planet X, does not exist. Well, now, here's the problem. Do any of you have telescopes capable of scanning the skies? You know, we are limited as to what we know, right? And, the, and what you get is controlled. It's controlled. So... Always elevate the Bible to first place Amen. with anything, anything that you read, anything that you study, anything that has to do with anything. Keep this in mind. Now, some folks think that NASA is nothing in the world more than a, than a uh, government conspiracy agent. Uh, they say that, uh, that, uh, that anything that NASA has had to say is based on lies and deception. I'm not here today to defend NASA. I did like it when they were sending men to the moon. I did like it when they were sending up spacecraft. That didn't bother me. Well, preacher, weren't you afraid they might find life on a, somewhere else? Well, they're hunting for life. They've got life here and don't know what to do with it. <laughs> That's the truth. Life on other planets. <laughs> Christian researcher has a head-spinning new doomsday prediction. A self-declared Bible researcher and conspiracy theorist who's predicted a number of failed doomsday dates is trying a new tack. Instead of giving a date, he's giving a range. David Mead, and so he goes. Now, I'm not going to get into all the detail of that, but here's the bottom line. The, well, you cannot stop these people from date setting. You can't do it. They're, they're going to do it, and there's nothing that you can do to stop them. But what I would suggest to these people who are date setters is that when your date does not come out the way you think it ought to, you need to publicly announce that you're going to get right with God for actively opposing what the Scripture says. Don't know the date. I want you to, let's do a little Bible study. Acts chapter number 1, verses 6 through 7. Now, this date setting of these uh, is not a new thing. Flat Earth, that's a new thing. The Mandela Effect, that's a new thing. But date setters, we've been plagued with them forever. Acts chapter number 1, verses 6 through 7. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, will thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? He said, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. This is after the resurrection. He's telling them that only God the Father knows the times and the seasons. Mark chapter number 13, verse 32. Now stay with me as we go through all this. Mark 13, 32. But of that day and that hour knoweth no man, know not the angels which are in heaven, Neither the Son, but the Father. What day? In the context of the whole second coming of Christ. All right. Now, look at John chapter number 11, verse number 23. You remember our brother preached from John 11 Sunday night. He read this scripture but did not expound on it because it wasn't part of what he was dealing with. He was talking about believe. 
and did a fine job on it. John chapter number 11 and verse number 23. Now look carefully. Jesus saith unto her, Thy brother shall rise again. Martha saith unto him, Now watch this carefully. I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Now why were the, what does she believe? We'll go to Isaiah chapter number 26 verse 18. Isaiah 26 verse 18. A lot of liberals are out here in these Bible colleges and teaching people that the Old Testament Jew didn't really believe in resurrection. That's a lie. He did believe in a resurrection. Isaiah chapter number 26 verse 18. Let's start reading with verse number 19. Thy dead men shall live. Together with my dead body shall they arise. Awake and sing, ye that dwell in the dust. For thy dew is as the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. Now turn to the book of Job, the oldest book in the Bible. Job. This is a classic passage. Job. Chapter number 19, verse 25. Job 19.25 For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God, whom I shall see for myself, and mine eyes shall behold, and not another, though my reins be consumed within me. Here's Job. 1,900 years before Christ, saying plainly, he believed in a resurrection. Now, how, how much had been taught about the resurrection, about stages in the resurrection, or anything of that nature? The only thing you can find about that in the Old Testament is typology. But we're not going to te doc teach doctrine from types. We're simply going to take what it states clearly. These two passages I read to you make it very clear. The Old Testament saint believed in a resurrection. So when the Lord talked to Martha over here in John chapter number 11. When he talked to Martha in John 11. He says to her, thy brother shall rise, he shall live again. Now look at it, now watch this. John chapter number 11, verse 22. Martha said, I know that even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it thee. Here's the Lord that answers her. Thy brother shall rise again. All right. What did Martha do? She put it in the context of what she understood. Sure, he'll rise again. Sure. There's coming a resurrection at the end of the days. Look at it carefully. Verse number 24. Martha saith unto him, I know he shall rise again in the resurrection. When? At the last day. All right. Was there anything wrong with, what, with, with Martha and what she understood here? Absolutely not. But was there more for her to know? Yes. That's the key to understanding Scripture. God has a chronology. He has a reason for revealing what He reveals when He reveals it. To Martha, He said, everything's changed. Verse 25. I am the resurrection. Now what does that really mean, preacher? It means that the date of the resurrection is no longer a date and a place and an event. The resurrection is a person. Being a person, it can include all that is involved with the resurrection depending on what that person does. Now, soak that up for a minute. The resurrection is no longer an event fixed in time. But it is a person who is the resurrection, and it is up to that person, that person, to be the one who calls forth from the dead. The Bible says the hour is coming when all in the graves will hear the voice of the Son of Man, Son of God, and come forth. John 5. They that have done good to the resurrection of life, they that have done evil to the resurrection of damnation. We talked about Elias. 
And of course, Elias is the Greek spelling of Eliah. Elohim is Jehovah, Elijah. And the Lord said something about him in Matthew chapter number 11. Matthew 11. Verse 14. Matthew eleven fourteen. 14. Here's what he said about him. If ye will receive it, this is Elias, which was for to come. Why was Elias going to come? Turn to Malachi. Last book in the Old Testament. When the Lord's quoting scripture, he didn't quote anything written at the time. No scripture had was written during the lifetime of Christ. Nothing, not a word, not a jot, not a tittle. Every scripture that Christ ever quoted was the Old Testament. So we come to the book of Malachi, last book in the Bible. Malachi, verse number, chapter 4, verse 5. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the what? The what day? All right, hold your place right here and turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2. Hold your place there with the day of the Lord. Come to 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2. Verse 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. All right. Coming of the Lord. Coming of the Lord. Is the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ an event? Or is the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ simply the reception of Christ into the lives of the believers? That's what the liberal thinks. Or is the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ a series of events? The coming of the Lord Jesus Christ is the Lord Jesus Christ. Just like the resurrection is the Lord Jesus Christ. Are you following me? The coming of the Lord Jesus Christ is the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Now look what he says here in 2 Thessalonians 2. I beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, our gathering together to him. Now he has introduced something here that, that, you know, Martha didn't know anything about this. But let's go ahead. You be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word, nor by letter as from us as at the day of what is at hand. All right. Why do all the new Bibles change that to Lord? See what they've done? You say the day of Christ and the day of the Lord is the same thing, preacher. No, it's not. No, it's not. The day of Christ and the day of the Lord are two entirely different things. Notice that Malachi over here says that I'll send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. So the, the Lord Jesus Christ, while he was here, said to them in Matthew chapter number 11, If you will receive it, this is Elijah, which was for to come. What was Elijah to come for? The day of the Lord. Now, well, where does the rapture fit in, preacher? There wasn't anything about a rapture here. And there wasn't anything about a rapture when he was talking to Martha. That's important to get that chronology right. There's nothing about a rapture. You see, until the church of God was born, the body of Christ was born on, on this earth, there was no need for a prophecy relating to a rapture. This is why the apostle turned to 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. Let's see. Verse 51. First Corinthians 15, 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. All right. We have something introduced now that was not known beforehand. And the reason it was not known beforehand is because the condition was not right for it because there was a variable relating to Israel that if they had received Malachi as the prophet, the day of the Lord would have come. That's why he was here. 
The day of the Lord is not the day of Christ. The day of Christ, 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2, is the rapture. The catching away of the saints of God. But Christ did not preach the rapture. Neither did John preach the rapture. Neither did Matthew, Mark, and Luke preach the rapture. None of them preached the rapture. All of them preach, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God. And then John the Apostle was the one God carried forth and said, let me show you all this stuff that's going to happen in the future. And started showing it to him. But it was the Apostle Paul that God took on the road to Damascus, saved, took him off into Arabia, and began to reveal the mystery of the rapture. Why? Because the Jew now had rejected the kingdom of heaven on earth. And since they had rejected that kingdom of heaven on earth, God had turned to the Gentiles. It was a spiritual body of Christ. And he, for 2,000 years, have had that spiritual body of Christ here on this earth. And he's going to come back and get it. But that is a, that's for you. You're looking back. That's old hat. That's old hat for you. You've heard that a thousand times in the church. Not a living soul knew a thing about that. That's a mystery. And the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 unfolds the mystery. And says, this is the mystery of the catching away of the saints of God. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4. Verse 13. 1, Corinthians, uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4 and verse number 13. I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. All right, let's get that right. Then they're sleeping in the ground. You think, you're, you think you're, your mothers and fathers and sons and daughters and husbands and wives and aunts and uncles and dearest loved ones are buried? Are they in the ground out here behind us? You, how many of you know that we're within a stone's throw of a huge graveyard? <laughs> a lot of folks visit here, they don't know that because they come in from that direction. But I can walk out here in this yard and I can throw a rock into a huge graveyard right behind us. And I have been in that graveyard I don't know how many times in 42 years. Everything from 20-year-olds to 90-year-olds. People killed in car wrecks, died from cancer, everything under the sun. I've been out here in this yard and I'll hear taps. I'll hear the 21-gun salute. And I'll know that they've got a veteran out there. You know, you, you know that's, that's part of it. There is nobody buried in that graveyard. Look what, carefully what it says. I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you saw or not, even as others which have no hope. If we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring, will he'll raise from the dead. See how it changes? What do you say? He'll bring them with him. I pointed that out to one of our school teachers 35 years ago up here, dear old soul. We were talking about the second coming. And I pointed that one scripture to her. She said, I've never seen that before. Because she believed in a general resurrection and she believed in soul sleep. See? That's what Martha believed in, a general resurrection. And look what he says. These that sleep in Jesus will God bring with Him. Now stop just a moment because if there's any doubt in your mind where people go when they leave this world, turn to 2 Corinthians. I've used this at, at, at funerals so many times. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1. For we know... That if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved. Does anyone have any problem understanding that simple terminology? Right? Earthly house is dissolved. We have a building of God. And house not made with hands. Eternal in the heavens. Alright? We have. Not going to have. We have. For in this we groan. Now watch this. Earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house. Which is from heaven. If so, that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle, this flesh, this body of flesh, do groan, being burdened. The older you get, the more you're going to groan. 
take my word for it. <laughs> for we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened. Not for that we would be unclothed. We, he's simply speaking clearly that the we are spirit beings and we want a body. Just like those demons that were in the man of, in that Gadara, the maniac of Gadara, they didn't want to be cast out into the open, into the, they, deem, spirits like bodies, folks. They're like a body. And so, look at verse number four. We would be, un, he said, being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon, that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Now he that hath wrought us for the selfsame thing as God, who also hath given us the earnest of the Spirit. If you have the Holy Ghost in you, you know you've got the Holy Ghost. You don't need anybody to tell you. And that is the down payment. That's what earnest means. I'm giving you earnest money to someone. I'm going to buy your property. I don't have it all with me. I'm going to go get the money, but here's a thousand bucks. And if I don't show up, that's your thousand dollars. You keep it. Man says, all right, you, you've given me earnest money. I'll accept that. You'll be back here by 12 o'clock tomorrow. You, you, property's yours. I won't sell it to anybody else. That's earnest money. You don't show up, you lost your thousand dollars. All right, now look at this. Therefore, we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. Look at the wording. We walk by faith, not sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and be floating around out here as a spirit somewhere. That's not what he said, did he? We are to be absent from the body and to be what? Present with the Lord. Therefore we labor, that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. And then he goes into the judgment seat of Christ and all of that. Is there any doubt in anybody's mind that when you leave this body, where are you going? Of course, now if you're unsaved, you're not going to be with the Lord. <laughs> yes, sir. Changing addresses. Just moving. That's exactly right. That's what uh, Gene Lawson said the other day. When uh, Brother and Sister Province went on to be with the Lord, he said, they, he said they didn't die, they just moved to another place. Just moved to the presence of the Lord. And that's what they did. That's what they did. And that's what you do if you know the Lord. What did he say in John 11? He that believeth in me shall do what? Never die. Never die. I give unto them eternal life in the future, and if they live right and hold on, it will be theirs one day. I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. That is a present possession. You're already living Amen. eternal life. And proof positive that you have eternal life, you have the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. I live for 27 years with an unholy ghost. <laughs> and there's a big difference between an unholy ghost and the Holy Ghost. Big difference. The way I live, my thoughts, my life, good and night, man. But when the Holy Spirit moved in, He changed me from the inside. Something wonderful, wonderful happened. All right? We shall not all sleep. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 51. We shall not all sleep. What's that mean? If there's a general resurrection at the end of the age, you know, and death is, in, is inevitable for everyone, then what is he talking about? He's talking about the rapture. He's talking about the fact that some of you are going to be alive at the coming of the Lord. Now, you know, deep down in my heart of hearts, I hope this old boy's right. <laughs> I hope the rapture does take place. But he has no business getting upset and dates and getting people all worked up over something. And then when it doesn't happen, then what's he done? A lot of people get carried away with this stuff. I have never in my life lived in a generation that is so enamored with men. We have so men followers. Follow the Lord, folks, not men. Men can lead you astray. Even the best of men can get messed up and get off. I, look, I go back over 42 years pastoring this church. Some of the things that I taught when I first came here, I heard somebody else teach it, and I thought, that sounds good. I'm going to work on that. So that's a, believe me, that's what goes on. Because they don't have any real 
foundation or basis, but that's what they hear all the rest of the preachers say. I heard a preacher say a long time ago, he was a real wise preacher. He says, preachers make their biggest fault in listening to each other. <laughs> and I believe there's an awful lot of truth in that. So what do you mean, preacher? I mean, I've learned a lot of things. I've learned some things. God has showed me things, especially in the Gospel of John, that uh, uh, just in the last few days. You want me to tell you what he showed me? I don't know if I'm going to do that or not. That's the way I do my wife. Let me show you John 14. I don't know why he does this. He just comes out of the clear blue. John 14, verse 1. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. For not so I told you, I go to prepare a place for you. Now watch this. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there ye may be also. And whither you go, whither I go, you know, and the way you know. Notice carefully. He is saying, He is the resurrection. I will receive you unto myself. But when you read Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the resurrection is an event. It's an event. You see, the rapture is not revealed the way the Apostle Paul had it revealed to him in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But in John, the foundation for the rapture is already being laid. The mystery of the rapture is revealed personally to the Apostle Paul. But when you read the Gospel of John, listen carefully, the last book of the Bible before the last book of the Bible the Apostle John wrote the last two books in the Bible. He wrote the Apocalypse, Revelation, and he wrote the Gospel of John. And the foundation for being caught personally up by the person who is the resurrection, John 11, is the Lord Jesus Christ. I will come and receive you unto myself. This is late, late, late. This is way after the rapture, the mystery of the rapture had been revealed. There's nothing else about the kingdom of heaven. No more kingdoms. No more kingdoms. Not until he comes as the king of kings and lord of lords. The gospel of John doesn't say a word about the kingdom of heaven. Not a word. So the, so the catching up, the resurrection in the gospel of John has nothing to do with an event. All of it has to do with a person. This is reinforcing what he said in John 11. You remember what he said to Martha? I am the resurrection. What's that mean? That means when the father said, go son. Just like that. Just like that. They come forth. They meet him in the clouds and in the air. He comes for his bride. You see? He comes for his bride. There's still going to be a resurrection. And the Lord Jesus Christ will call them forth. But that's at the end of the tribulation. And you know, when you think about it, uh, what does the word resurrection mean? Raised from the dead, right? Well, you're not dead. They that sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. You don't raise... Christians from the dead. Do you? No. You raise the dead from the dead. Right? Yeah. And it even goes so far in Isaiah to say that the earth shall cast out the Rephaim. Rapha. That same word Rephaim is translated earlier as giants in the Old Testament. So... The dead are raised from the dead, right? But the Christian is not raised from the dead because the Christian's not dead. 
So when the Lord Jesus Christ comes, He is the resurrection. And we come with Him to be caught up together. And the only reason He comes back, by the way, is to raise a glorified body from the ground. It's the final shout of the victory. He shouted the victory at the cross at Calvary over sin. He'll shout the victory at the resurrection or the raising up of the bodies of the, of the redeemed over death. And the Apostle Paul said that in 1 Corinthians 15. O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? Hallelujah to God. Amen. Amen. Run out of time. <laughs> Brother dismissed.